Good evening everyone and welcome to the Melbourne Graduate School of Education's first Dean's Lecture for 2023. So fantastic to have people all back together face to face and to be able to enjoy what I'm sure is going to be an outstanding evening tonight. My name is Jim Waddiston, I'm the Dean of the Melbourne Graduate School of Education and it's a privilege to welcome you here all tonight and to uh, enjoy what is going to be a fantastic celebration of International Women's Day. Uh, I've listened to a lot of media today about International Women's Day and it's um, hardly a celebration, I think, as we listen to the facts and figures that have uh, been rolled out during the day and, and prior, prior and, and probably after today about the um, shortcomings in terms of salaries and pay and, uh, and 790 statues across Victoria, of which nine are women. Uh, there was one more added today. but. We are still working very hard to make sure that International Women's Day is not just one day where we, where we celebrate uh, women and their achievements, but uh, recognition of how much more work there is to do. I would like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging, and uh, note that uh, this land uh, has always been unceded and that uh, we acknowledge the place also of the Indigenous knowledges in the Academy and recognise First Nations people as our very first teachers here in this education faculty. I'd also like to extend a respect to any other Indigenous Australians present. So without any further ado, I would like to welcome tonight's uh, Dean's Lecture presenter and uh, someone that I've had the opportunity to meet with just recently. So. I am truly delighted to welcome and introduce our special guest uh, speaker, Maxine Beniba clark I'd like to take a few minutes to just uh, acquaint you to Maxine's work and, uh, and her pathway getting here tonight uh, and the many achievements that she's been able to, to, to gather uh, throughout her career. So I'm going to read this because I wouldn't be able to do justice by, by, uh, without, without reading and just letting you know of the, just, uh, the amazing life that she's had to this point. So Maxine Beniba clark is an Australian writer of Afro-Caribbean descent and the multi-award winning author of over 10 published books for children, adults and, and adults, and including this book, which is The Hate Race. And hands up, who's read this book? Yep, quite a number of you. Well, I hadn't. I hadn't read the book and so I've spent the last week reading it and um, like I'm sure all of you that have read it, uh, it certainly made me reflect over the whole week and think about my own childhood and the school that I went to, it sounded very similar to Maxine's and, uh, and, and it's been making me sort of relive the way some of the, the um, non-white Australians were treated at the school that I was at and certainly uh, it, having read this book, uh, it's just um, compelling to, to, to know that working in schools, we probably haven't eliminated that racism and we probably haven't eliminated the challenges that, uh, that people who, who aren't white Australians sometimes suffer from in, in those, uh, in, in those uh, environments. And so this book, I'm sure, has affected um, positively uh, so many people who have read it. And I'm sure that uh, as a teacher myself for most of my life, um, that we don't have teachers in schools who uh, were portrayed in this book um, as, as Maxine did uh, in the way that she related her education and, and some of the incredible challenges that she had to put up with including this book, uh, the, the Indie and ABIA <laughs> award-winning short fiction collection, Foreign Soil, the uh, poetry collection, Carrying the World, which won the, the 2017 Victoria's Premier Literary Award for Poetry, and several acclaimed children's picture books, including The Patchwork Bike, winning the Boston Globe Horn Prize and the internationally acclaimed illustrated poem, When We Say Black Lives Matter. Maxine studied law and arts at Wollongong University, majoring in creative writing and anti-discrimination law and human rights, and worked for the Anti-Discrimination Board of the New South, uh, in New South Wales. In December last year, the University of Melbourne announced Maxine's appointment as the inaugural Peter Steele Poet in Residence within the Faculty of Arts. Maxine's year-long appointment, beginning in January this year, will see her raise the profile of poetry in the Faculty of Arts and the University more broadly. If I may quote my um, esteemed fellow Dean of the Faculty of Arts, the Reverend Professor Russell Goldwyn, who said, the role of a poet in residence aims to enrich our communal experience of place, purpose and connection 
and to bring poetry to a wider audience. The position is a significant step towards giving poetry the exalted role it deserves in Australian society. I couldn't agree more. Maxine's books and poetry are also embedded in the curriculum of the Melbourne Graduate School of Education teacher education courses and used in our professional learning programs and practice-based research both nationally and internationally. She is the editor of Best Australian Stories 2017 and 2019 anthology Growing Up African in Australia. Maxine's books are currently distributed in Australia by a number of prestigious publishing houses. Her short fiction, poetry, reviews and articles have been published widely, including The Age, The Weekend Australian, The Guardian, The Big Issue, Vogue, Overland and Menjin. She wrote creative portraits of interesting people for the Saturday paper from 2014 to 2018 and in 2019 became the inaugural poet laureate for the Saturday paper, producing a poem a week on issues of national interest. These poems have been collected and anthologised in her latest poetry collection, How Decent Folk Behave, 2021, which was shortlisted for the 2022 Victorian Premier's Award for Poetry. Many of you will be delighted to learn that Maxine has recently adapted her memoir, the, the book I showed you, The Hate Race, for the Australian stage in collaboration bet uh, between Melbourne's Malthouse Theatre and Sydney's Griffin Theatre and is scheduled for production in 2024. And for those who prefer to watch the small screen, Maxine is currently in the process of, de of developing her short fiction collection, Foreign Soil, for television. Foreign Soil has also been on the VCE li uh, literature text list since 2017 and her memoir The Hate Race has been on the VCE English text list since 2022. In her capacity as an author she has visited and guest taught at over 60 high schools across Victoria. Not only a, pro a prolific author, Maxine is a very talented artist and illustrator seeing it as part of her writing process. She decided to illustrate her own picture books after seeing how much enjoyment the illustrators of her previous picture books gained from her work. <laughs> sure, it saves a lot of money as well. <laughs> a self-described multidisciplinary writer, I'm sure you will all agree that considering Maxine's very impressive resume and her powerful advocacy for gender and racial justice in education, as well as the incredible power of her poetry and fiction, that we are very fortunate to have her here presenting to us tonight on such an important occasion as International Women's Day. So without any further ado, could you please join me in welcoming Maxine Beniba clark to the stage to deliver her book. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Hello. <laughs> um, I too would like to acknowledge that we're on Aboriginal land this evening, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And particularly when talking about the telling of stories, I just want to acknowledge all of the stories that have unfolded and been told here since time began. So I was going to kind of make a joke to start, you know, this, this session. Um, and what I was going to say was that, you know, International Women's Day, I get so many invitations that I've always said if I could just get 100 black women that look like me and shave their heads, we could make out like bandits. <laughs> and then someone outside actually said they'd been mistaken for me outside. So, so. <laughs> but, you know, I think International Women's Day is a very complicated day for a lot of women because, you know, when you are a woman of colour, you are an international woman every day. Everything you do in every part of your life is, you know, uh, affected by the fact that you are a woman of colour. And so it's a day that we celebrate, but also it's a kind of day that I guess I, I often get a little bit jaded about. But I'm thrilled to be here talking to you this evening. Um, I want to thank uh, Professor, Professor uh, Jim Watterson. I want to thank uh, Professor Larissa McLean Davies and also Yvette McDermott for inviting me here. I think there are a lot of milestones in my career um, and this is definitely one of them, being invited to deliver a Dean's Lecture and also being invited by the Faculty of Arts uh, and Professor Russell Goldman to actually be poet in residence at the university. <coughs> so these are things that, you know, although I can kind of make jokes about the occasion, are very significant and I realise the gravity of being invited to stand on this stage today. 
So I'm going to be talking this evening about being a writer on the Australian syllabus, being a black woman on the Australian syllabus, and about some of my experiences in high schools, and about how really having that interface with young people has changed a lot of the way that I make work and become uh, an ongoing conversation between myself and young people and indeed the people who teach them. So I thought I would uh, start by um, reading three poems, given that I am here as poet in residence. And these poems I thought I'd read uh, for those who maybe are not familiar with my work. They're all poems which take existing narratives and really give you a parallel na narrative or ask you to think a little bit about what other stories might be present within them. And they're all from my book, How Decent Folk Behave. The first is titled Dorothy. Dorothy down the yellow brick lost a lion's share of teeth grit. She gave away everything she knew, even a chamber of a beating heart to a tin man who couldn't feel. All the boys, they got what they wanted before the velvet curtain dropped. And we still call her story the wizard of Oz. The second poem is titled Icarus, and again it's a kind of a, a rewriting of, of an existing narrative. Icarus, her father fashioned wings, but he made her flight a conditional thing, said don't fly too high, baby girl when you fly, just don't fly too high. But Icarus said, I am going to burn, and I might burn, but I will fly. And mark my words, I will see every altitude before I die. Uh, the last poem to open my talk is a poem that's a little closer to home, perhaps, and it's titled Capital. In grade five, they bus our children to the capital, to the long white building, high majestic on the hill, where the boys often learn, you study hard, you might well work here one day, mate, while the girls hang back and button their collars. This place is where women get raped. So I became a book-listed author on the VCE syllabus quite unexpectedly. Around 2016, my publishers contacted me to say that there'd been a request for 20 or so copies of my short fiction collection, Foreign Soil, to be sent to the committee that decides texts. It's a kind of a very random thing that happens as an author to be told, oh, you know, these people have asked for 20 copies of the book. Uh, my publisher explains that this meant that someone had nominated the text for inclusion and that it had passed that nomination stage to proper consideration. And we kind of joked about it. The idea that a book like Foreign Soil would ever be greenlit for high school consumption, we thought we'd surely never hear from the committee again. Foreign Soil is a short fiction collection containing 10 short stories. It's set across the world in Uganda, Jamaica, Australia, America, England, and pre-separation Sudan. Harlem Jones follows a young black British teenager who becomes involved in a street protest with his mate after the death of a young local black man. The story ends abruptly with 17-year-old Harlem standing holding a Molotov cocktail as the police presence pushes the protest from peaceful to volatile. The story Gaps in the Hickory is the story of a young gender non-conforming child li living through hard financial times with his parents and little sister in the deeply conservative American South. Carter keeps a sparkly bracelet deep down in the sock drawer and at night Carter's father goes out riding with the clan. The only one who understood Carter, other than little sister Lucinda, was Grandma Izzy, and now she's gone. In the story Shu Yi, 
a young African diaspora primary school kid in early, 19, early 1990s Sydney, is tasked with looking after her new classmate, Shu Yi. In order to protect herself and sneak some kind of status in the racially volatile schoolyard of post-white Australia, Ava fails miserably to be any kind of friend or ally to Shu Yi. In the story Railton Road, we enter the Black Panther squats of 1960s London and meet a group of young black revolutionaries who want to equalise a society that's decidedly hostile to their existence and will do so by any means necessary. The story The Stilt Fisherman takes place in Sydney's notorious Villawood Detention Centre. Each of the characters, asylum seeker Asanka, his Anglo-Australian lawyer, her indifferent second generation boyfriend, the detention centre guards, those who assist Asanka to reach Australia and the politicians turning up for photo ops. They all represent a different interest or perspective on Australia's immigration deba debate. So we thought this text surely had no chance of passing, passing muster. When I was studying for my HSC in New South Wales some 25 years ago, we studied Jane Austen's Emma and Pride and Prejudice. We studied Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing and The Twelfth Night. We explored a unit called Utopias and Anti-Utopias, which included Brave New World, Sir Thomas More's Utopia and Orwell's 1984. White canonical texts that had been studied at my local high school for decades and decades. I knew in 2016 that text lists had moved on significantly. The previous year's VCE list had included Wildcat Falling, the film Marbo by Rachel Perkins, and The Plain No Sugar by Jack Davis. Also the short fiction collection That Thing Around Your Neck by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. I was still shocked when eight months later I got an email from the first English teacher asking if I would visit the classroom since my text was now on the VCE literature list. I literally sprayed my coffee all over the laptop screen. <laughs> and I thought that only happened in bad American sitcoms or hilarious Twitter memes. As an author, I was reluctant to do school visits. If you've read my memoir, The Hate Race, which is currently on the VCE text list, you'll know my own school experience was not a pleasant one. In addition, there have been horror stories about Australian and international authors being harassed and trolled en masse by students because their poem popped up on an HSC exam. Hordes of disgruntled teenagers wanting someone to blame for their inability to analyse a text. In 2021, HSC, student, HSC students harassed acclaimed Vietnamese American author Ocean Vuong after an, an extract from his novel, On Earth We're Briefly Gorgeous, left them bewildered. One student's mother even contacted Ocean Vuong on social media, saying, can you send me more information? My son tried to write about your text today and he still doesn't know what it's about. <laughs> Ocean Vuong screenshotted and posted the message, saying, guys, they've got their mums out here digging in my messages. <laughs> Another student complained, we're failing because you decided to write about how you plucked your grandmother's hair. <laughs> this might seem less ominous if several years earlier an Aboriginal poet had been subjected to an avalanche of racist abuse via social media when a poem of theirs appeared on an HSC exam. Writers of colour, it seemed to me, did not fare well when their work was used on the Australian curriculum. Add to that, I don't see myself really as a good teacher. I'm not patient, I'm sarcastic and ironic by default, I hide my phone under the desk when it's supposed to be in my locker and I usually don't have my listening ears on. <laughs> Being told by a 17 year old that something is not a real short story because it has no proper ending or being asked why aren't there more white characters in your book is quite the trip. But I went to that first school and we unpacked these things. Is this a real short story? A traditional short story has five parts. So let's take a look at whether this story has all of these five parts. And if it doesn't, which parts are missing? Why might I have chosen to leave the ending off? What do you think your role is as a reader in responding to a story that could end any way you want it to? How would you end the story and why would you end it that way? Why don't I write more stories about white people? 
Let's look up the 1989 interview in which Toni Morrison is asked the same question by then iconic Australian journalist Jana Wendt and see what you think about Morrison's answer. I won't tell you in detail, but one particular line in her reply really strikes me. It is inconceivable to you that where I already am is the mainstream. Being an author, not just on the Australian school curriculum, but in dialogue with teachers and young people about the work they're studying on the curriculum, often starts out as a lecture and ends up as a conversation. This lecture is titled, Being a Black Female Author on the Australian Syllabus, but of course, the nuances matter. There are the other facets of my experience that influence how and why I write. I am Afro-Black of Afro-Caribbean heritage. I'm the daughter of black British migrants born in the West Indies, in Jamaica and Guyana. We are descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. My mother is an actor. Some might have seen her on commercial television in the evenings, putting an apron on as her fake Woolworths colleagues introduced their green produce. Or perhaps you took your kids to see her as Grandma Poss in the touring production of Possum Magic a few years ago. In the 80s and 90s, there weren't many roles for African diaspora actors in Australia. So I grew up being forced to read the two plays where theatre companies would always pick up the phone to my mother. Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird and Christopher, Sergal, uh, Christopher Sergal's adaptation of Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird and Arthur Miller's The Crucible. I read lines from these plays with my mother over and over and over again and I loved it until I hated it. But I'm sure this is where my obsession with dialogue and vernacular comes from and the ability to see what a political fiction text can do. My father was an academic, a mathematician. My accountant will tell you I inherited nothing from him. <laughs> but he was an avid record collector, and I mean avid. His PhD was something to do with electromagnetic theory. I have no idea what that means. But this obsession extended to sound waves, which facilitated his love of music. One entire wall of our lounge room was wall to wall with, was end to end with hundreds of albums. He built his own giant speakers from scratch. They were four foot tall and a foot and a half wide. They sat at either end of our lounge room and his listening chair sat facing the speakers, <laughs> measured to the exact point of maximum sound absorption. <laughs> If one of us three kids bumped the chair from chasing each other around the house or just flopping down on it too hard as sloppy teenagers do, he would drop the needle on the record player, sit down, and then within moments he would cock his head, stand up, and walk around the chair in a circle. Then, in an unintentionally Goldilocks and the Three Bears kind of way, he would boom, who's been sitting in my chair? <laughs> no one ever replied. The code of protection was uniform, even though sometimes it was mum who'd been sitting in the chair while she folded clothes or braided our hair. I didn't go for the chair, I went for the record sleeves. When I start the story, Harlem Jones, with the line, Harlem legs it from the job shop as soon as she pushes the button for security, shoots like the fucking wind. Perhaps I learnt that fast opening from Bob Dylan's pistol shots ring out in the barroom night. Enter Penny Valentine from the upper hall. She sees the bartender in a pool of blood. When in the story Railton Road, the protagonist Solomon Lucas gives a sermon about the origins of Christian pro-slavery rhetoric as attributed to Genesis in the Bible, I imagined it being performed in the low baritone of Odetta's song, where she says, Moses, Moses, don't let King Pharaoh overtake you, Moses, don't let King Pharaoh overtake you in some lonesome graveyard. Did using poetry as a means to talk about politics seed from listening to Tracy Chapman's a cappella song, Behind the Wall? A song about hearing domestic violence through a shared wall and calling police who turn up late and do nothing or who don't turn up at all. Or perhaps from hearing the spoken word of the last poets, or of Jamaican dub poet Linton Kwesi Johnson on my father's vinyl. Then of course there's a long tradition of West African, Afro-Caribbean and Black British writing which I have for years been attuned to. Novelist and non-fiction writer Jamaica Kincaid, 
Jamaican poets Jean Binter Breeze, Je Benjamin Zaphaniah and Stacey Ann Chin, the founding negritude poets such as Ame Césaire and Leon Damas. The point is, we are all authors, as all people are, the sum of our <coughs> histories, our exposures, our environments, and the life experiences that have brought us right here to this exact point in time. Me, standing at this lectern, and you choosing to sit where you sit now. This is ultimately why diverse work matters. Because when the creator of the work has had different life experiences, the work is often different. Reading is about both opening and entering other worlds, about shared experience and about sharing experiences. I received a phone call some days ago from a journalist for a national paper. They were wanting to write a story about the sensitivity editing of the work of British children's author Roald Dahl. <coughs> I was asked what I thought about the more offensive descriptions of characters being removed from the author's children's book. And what I said was, why are we talking about Roald Dahl? They were doing a ring around of diverse authors to ask their opinion on the work of one of the most recognised white male children's authors in the world. I grew up reading Dahl's books. There were many things I liked about them. He wrote courageous, resourceful, brave children, particularly, I thought, the girls. The unnamed eight-year-old in The Magic Finger who turns her duck hunting neighbour into ducks. Matilda Wormwood set up against her unscrupulous, neglectful parents. But the older I got reading his books, the more uncomfortable I felt. We know Dahl was a self-declared anti-Semite. We know he wrote the Oompa Loompas from Charlie and the Chocolate Factory as happy slaves, pygmies from Africa. But he's also older women who get a bad rap. The nasty grandma from George's Marvelous Medicine, the cruel spinster aunties from James and the Giant Peach who starve their nephew and make him sleep on bare floorboards, Principal Miss Trunchbull from Matilda, and of course, the witches. Apart from some random asides about how beauty comes from within, the general outlook seems to be that we are either Miss Honey types or Miss Trunchbull types, and there is nothing in between. Perhaps these views are typical of a British man of his age and era, but whatever the case, they cannot be removed from his work simply by removing overtly offensive phrases. They are written deep into the fabric of it, in the way stories were structured and in the way characters were devised. The only way to give another perspective on this time is to find another perspective on the time. For example, Popo and Fafina, the iron the the iconic 1930 collaboration between Harlem Renaissance authors Langston Hughes and Anna Bontemp. In fact, the black writers of the Harlem Renaissance made children's literature a particular interest of theirs. Also writing during Dahl's time is African-American children's author Walter Dean Myers, born in 1937. He published more than 60 books for young people. Dahl wrote 18 for young people and 49 altogether. What other authors were out there trying to publish work? Is that work still available? Can we unearth it and publish it? Can we reprint it? And if not, why not? When diverse writers are on the syllabus, the conversation changes. It doesn't change by erasing the conversations that already exist. It change by, changes by contextualizing them, pointing them out, providing a counter narrative, <coughs> and providing students with the permission and analytical tools to compare, critique, and contrast. We should read Alice Pung's Lorinda, alongside Tim Winton's Breath, alongside Melina Marchetta's Looking for Ella Brandy, alongside Kath Moore's Metal Fish Falling Snow. I believe she's here in the audience today. Say hello to her. <laughs> alongside Jared Thomas's Songs That Sound Like Blood. Sometimes censorship looks like actively choosing to whiten the reading world of an entire generation by only encouraging them to read the straight white Western canon. Being a black author on the curriculum means, not always, but often, that your work lands in a classroom where kids have historically not studied much work by non-white authors. It may be the first time an Anglo-Australian student has not been centred in something they've had to read. 
And it might be the first time an African diaspora Australian kid has been handed a text that is more a mirror than a window. What does it mean as a writer to physically enter that space? Of course, the politics of school author visits are fraught. Which schools do you visit when you're an author with limited time and your book is on the VCE list? Do you decide in the interest of supposed equality not to go at all? I've had many policies over the years from a Robin Hood system where visiting an elite private school then allows me to visit several low SES public schools that might take more petrol and more time to get to to holding mass open school sessions at a hired venue so kids from any school can hop on the train and attend to doing Twitter and Facebook Q&As. As a black author, I will try to make it to a school that has a high percentage of children of colour, though it's not always possible. It's not so much that having the author in the classroom gives students an advantage because everything they need is already there in the text and teachers by and large are doing a fabulous job. And there are always teachers' notes available for the work. It's that it opens up conversations, and conversations can open up hearts and worlds and readers. The power to some kids of standing a woman of colour up in front of an English class when the English teaching workforce is primarily white and saying, this person is an expert in their field and they wrote the book in your hand cannot be underestimated. That's not to say every author should or would want to visit. Indeed, many could think of nothing worse. <laughs> Ultimately, I am a creator and not a teacher. And sometimes it definitely feels like an ill-advised sticking of my head above the parapet. I've seen more of Victoria both demographically and geographically than I ever thought I would. I've been in classrooms in Geelong, Werribee and South Yarra. I've been to Point Cork, Altona, Kew and Berwick. I've been to Glen Iris, Bacchus Marsh and Truganina, to Tarnit, to Cranbourne East, to Flemington and St Kilda, to Footscray, Williamstown, Fitzroy, Canterbury and more. The conversations I've had as a visiting author are conversations I'm sure are sometimes tedious and boring, but I'm also sure that sometimes they plant a seed. Foreign Soil was on the literature text list for five years, and by and large it was studied by highly literate students, if studied at year 12 level. But it also began around the same time to be book listed by individual schools from grades 9 to 11. As a short fiction collection, it was sometimes the whole book that was studied and sometimes just a handful of stories. I met an African diaspora student from one school who told me it was the only book he'd ever read from start to finish. I asked if he'd read any other books by black writers and he said, no, they never gave us one before, miss, and I don't know how to use the library. The teacher said, you do know how to use the library, don't be silly, mortified. But he was insistent, nah, but miss, I mean, I didn't know they have those types of books in the library and I don't know how to find those books. Ask the librarian, the teacher said, exasperated. She's right there waiting to help you. I met the librarian later. Her text selection was actually impeccable and very diverse. It was a well-stocked library, but if you don't already know the names of the authors, Imagine the potential discomfort of being a 16-year-old black boy and walking into the library to ask the middle-aged white librarian if she can show you where are the books written by black people that a black boy might like. The alternative, I guess, if you know where to start, is to Google and then look them up on the library system. But these are teenagers we're talking about. <laughs> we need to make it easier. A lot of school libraries manage this well by having a rotating display in the library window or the library space of diverse books, and now this school does that too. I was on the school's program of Melbourne Writers Festival in 2019 when a group of Anglo-Australian teenage boys, four of them, built like rugby players, approached me and introduced themselves. They were from a school three hours away in a remote country town. Only the four of them had taken literature and their English teacher had book listed foreign soil. One of them spoke for all of the others. We just wanted to come and meet you, he said. We really enjoyed the book and where we live, we would never meet the kind of people you wrote about. So we had so many interesting conversations. The others were too nervous to talk. <laughs> it's a simplistic mantra, I know, but this is what reading ultimately and writing is all about. Visiting worlds in our minds we perhaps cannot in the physical realm. 
And that world doesn't always have to be a Hogwarts or a Middle Earth. It can be a world parallel to the one you know that was previously closed off to you. There was the tiny literature class, mostly kids of colour, that I met in a demountable classroom in Point Cook. They laughingly described how the five of them would burst into class every Monday morning after being tasked with reading a different story from the book every weekend. And they would talk all over the top each of each other saying, oh my God, what the fuck just happened? Did you expect that to happen? Oh my God. <laughs> of course, as an author, this is the stuff that dreams are made of. And of course, as an author, you also need to be prepared for kids who hate or disagree with the work. The kid who said he didn't like one of the characters in Foreign Soil. He thought he was mean and nasty. We had a discussion about the concept and origins of the black anti-hero. The fact that black characters for a long time were the happy slaves of Uncle Tom's cabin, expected to hum along and be passive to everything that happened to them, so as not to upset the sensibilities of white readers. We spoke about the groundbreaking novel Native Son by Richard Wright and how James Baldwin, his fa fellow African-American writer, really disagreed with the book. We spoke about why readers might feel uncomfortable to encounter a young black man on a page who had total autonomy over his story, often in a decidedly boundary-pushing or even illegal way. We spoke about how he would feel reading the story in isolation, as opposed to as part of a collection of stories with a spectrum of black characters. Another student asked about the politics of my writing. Why does there always have to be a social comment buried underneath? <laughs> I spoke about the history of black artists using art as subterfuge, the Brazilian art of capoeira, martial, uh, dance disguised as mar uh, martial arts disguised as dance, as a way to secretly pass down warrior techniques under the oppressive eye of the plantation master. We spoke about gospel. It was a Christian school. I asked if carry me home Jesus meant something different when we knew that the very first slave ship to arrive on the west coast of Africa was a Portuguese ship named Jesus of Lubeck. Does everyone know when they sing Michael Row the Boat Ashore that the first known recording of this spiritual was from former slaves rowing to freedom? What does it mean to be part of this legacy as a writer? And what does it mean in terms of responsibility as someone who is now a published author when hundreds of years ago, those in my bloodline would have been punished, maimed or killed for having the audacity to try and learn to read and write? Would that have any be bearing on my decision in the story of Big Island to centre an intelligent and vivacious but illiterate Jamaican man? to write an accent into the story, putting readers in the position of having to learn how to listen to him and not the other way around. Are these deep dives necessary in order to get a good mark on a VCE exam? Definitely not. In fact, they often take the class down a loophole that takes them away from talking about the text itself. But they offer insight into the creative thinking process that students might not otherwise have access to and the kinds of creative decision, decisions made. There was a kid in school uniform who hovered by a signing table at a writers' festival school session for half an hour, watching people get their books signed, until eventually I realised what was happening and called her over. I asked her name, signed a poetry book and gave it to her. She told me it was the first book she'd ever owned that was just hers. She said she, uh, that was just hers that she didn't have to buy for school. Our education system, like society, remains devastatingly unequal. It's interesting meeting the teachers for these texts too. Often they will tell you more stories than the teens tell you themselves. Like the teacher who told me studying, the, studying foreign soil was the first time a particular student spoke in, in class. Or the particular story initiated a massive argument that was then turned into a formal class debate. Sometimes the school visits turn into a weird psychological probe. <laughs> like the class who asked me, did I intentionally name the father and child in Gaps in the Hickory after two former US presidents, Democrat James L. Carter and Andrew Jackson? <laughs> no. Well, why did you choose those names? I don't know, I just picked those names. <laughs> well, maybe you subconsciously did it then. <laughs> Did you mean the title Gaps in the Hickory to reference gaps in time like a hickory clock? 
no. <laughs> it just felt like we were watching the family drama unfold through the gaps in the hickory trees. And then when the father is collecting wood to go on his burning torch escapades, they leave literal gaps in the hickory. But I liked their explanation better. And then, of course, there's social media. Foreign Soil was on the literature book list, which meant classes were small and students were generally engaged. For the first couple of years, there wasn't much contact outside classroom visits. The odd email or Facebook message asking a question or saying how much they'd enjoyed the work. But I did notice when the book was studied by a younger class, there'd be Malvia engagement. Like the grade 10 kid who messaged me saying, we studied your work at school, it sucks, kill me now. <laughs> to which I unceremoniously shot back, sucked in, I am the new Shakespeare. <laughs> His typing ellipsis hovered in the comment box for several minutes and eventually trailed off into stunned silence. <laughs> this contact with students increased with the hate race when the, when the memoir was put on the English syllabus. There was the year 12 boy enraged at the behaviour of my childhood bully in the book who sent a message saying, I want to punch Greg Adams in the face and I wasn't even there. <laughs> the kid who begged me to come to her 18th birthday party just for five minutes because she'd bet her friends she could get Maxine from the hate race to attend. Part of me wanted to show up and drink them all under the table. <laughs> There was the spectacled girl in the line next to me at Coles who was just staring at me with a weird smile on her face and then blurted out with no introduction, I'm on the debating team too! <laughs> to which I couldn't help laughing. I'm freaking out right now, she said, her cheeks flushing. These encounters are by, by turns weird, annoying, intrusive and hilarious. But the conversations go two ways. As an author having so much exposure to young people, this has completely changed the way that I create. Meeting teens on author visits who struggle to read, for example, has meant that the picture books I create and those I collaborate on need to be suitable for adults and children. Not many older humans want to be stuck reading Spot the Dog as a constant rem reminder that they haven't had the help or the opportunity to learn to read well. I'm going to kind of take you through some of the ways my work has changed. Um, a little bit of a slideshow. So the books that I made, created, after The Hate Race and Foreign Saw all have in some way been influenced by the conversations I've had in classes. The Saturday Portraits is a collected book of profiles that I wrote for the Saturday paper about interesting people. Um, some interesting, some not, some just interesting encounters. So there's a profile of Tony Abbott, there's one of Hugh Jackman, there's one of Roxane Gay. And I was publishing them in the Saturday paper and teachers kept contacting me saying, we need short pieces like this, can you put this into book form? And so this was very quickly, you know, it's one of those books that kind of had no promotion, but I thought I need to make this available as a collection to teachers. And another thing that teachers were, kept talking to me about was the editing process, how kids never want to edit. They always want to hold in the first draft and they don't, they don't see the need for editing. So in that book of portraits, we included um, two things. One was a middle section that has 23 pages of actual unedited work. So notes that I took while I was interviewing people, printouts of first drafts, um, where I'd kind of gone over with red pen and made changes to them and also some, um, includes some emails from my editor, kind of saying this is what I think is working, this is what I don't think is working. And it's also book-ended by two 5,000 word essays that talk about the writing process. And I think probably the book would just have been put out as a collection of portraits had I not had that, that dialogue with teachers. Um, the second book, um, probably, uh, well, The Patchwork Bike, um, the kids' books really all have been created, all with the exception of Wide Big World, have been created with the idea that I, I also had feedback from the Indigenous Literacy Foundation that they were using some of my work to teach adults to read. And so bearing that in mind, as I said, um, in terms of creating work that doesn't necessarily look or read like a children's book, including When We Say Black Lives Matter, which I will read actually at the end of this section, um, and Fashionista, which is just a book that's a fashion anthem, and 11 Words for Love and the Patchwork Bike. Um, so these, this is some graphics from the Patchwork Bike. Uh, part of that kind of wanting to create children's books that also appeal to adults is in the choice of illustrator or how it's illustrated. 
This book was illustrated by a street artist named Van T. Rudd. He's a Vietnamese Australian artist, also happens to be Kevin Rudd's nephew. Uh, but he's kind of a very fierce um, socialist activist. Um, and I'd seen his murals out and about on the street. And so I kind of tracked him down and said, would you like to move in, uh, into illustration? And so an interesting thing with this book in terms of trying to explain the process of writing and make kids not scared of writing is that it was, it was illustrated on old packing, cardboard packing boxes because Van's a street artist. He doesn't work with necessarily expensive art materials. So that idea that you can just work with what you've got. He left a lot of things that most artists would take off. So for example, you can see there's a piece of sticky tape here left on from the packing box. You can see that little fragile sticker at the bottom there. And also if you can see those grubby marks, Van doesn't work in a studio. So he was working under his carport and he had dogs that kept walking over. <laughs> So this is kind of a really good example of the fact that you can have these happy accidents in, in the creation of art. And just, I suppose, an example of a book that might appeal to adults as well as children, because there's a lot of artwork in it, like this tree landscape that's quite abstract. There's another still from the book. You can see again the, the duct tape there. Now, in terms of responding to to things that happen in classrooms. This page, you have an abandoned police car in the background and the figures on the back are actually doing, one of them is doing a pirouette on this abandoned police car. And it's a pirouette that I believe was a statue that was um, placed on Wall Street during the Occupy Wall Street um, protests. There was a statue that was kind of doing that similar pirouette. So it's a reference to kind of, I suppose, poverty and the 99% versus the 1%. So what happened when this book was published in the United States? Somewhere, I believe, in Texas, this book was handed out to um, first grade students. And the book did quite well. It was Children's Book of Australia Honor Book. It won something called the Boston Globe Horn Prize Award in the US. Then it was handed out to, I believe, all the grade one students in a particular district in the deep American South. One kid had a police officer in the family who um, saw this, um, this uh, image in the book and it was, I think, confiscated. We're still trying to find out exactly what happened, but it was confiscated from these kids because it was considered too controversial. So I started thinking as a writer, what, how do you respond to that? You know, these kids, some of whom are inevitably black kids who finally got this book where there's a black family in it and it's confiscated um, from them. Um, so, um, I have a, a poetry book coming out for kids um, in June, and I'm going to read um, the poem that responds to this. It's called, There's a Shelf in the Library. There's a shelf in the library, you've probably heard, that's political proud. They say it's reserved for the bigger kids who are more mature, but I tell you, there's ripping tales galore. There are tales about protesting things that are bad and books that were banned by complaining dads and by mums who don't think we should see the true world, who think some love is bad and that pink is for girls. There's a shelf in the library Miss Lara protects. They are sacking the teachers. We're scared she'll be next. For permission, she'll ask how old you last turned, what class you're in, and she'll look concerned if your parents are on the PNC or your name's on the list of don't let them read. There's a shelf in the library. It's holding the truth. Miss L says she'll stand there until the last moon, protecting the stories that matter the most, of histories lost, of pride, pride, courage and hope. There's a shelf in the library. They'll be here at lunch. Miss Lara says she'll be brave when they come. Courage is something that shelf taught to us. When we see them arriving, we all just show up. We link our arms and we circle the desk and we say, we won't move if you want to arrest us. A man from the paper is snapping away and the folks who have come, they look kind of ashamed. So they leave with their orders. They'll be back, so they say, but our shelf in the library is safe one more day. That shelf in the library we defended with love and fought hard for our right to read what we want. We own our thoughts, not anyone else. And that shelf it has taught us rage has to be felt. It can be channeled, can be harnessed for good. And Miss L, she is no longer here at our school. But we keep strong her book list. It's now here to stay. Her legacy lives in my locker today. There's a shelf in my locker. Shh, don't tell you've heard. 
you can ask for a borrow. My library's reserved for those who love freedom and thinking and truth. By the time that they raid it, those books will have moved. And we'll keep making shelves all over this land of books they won't stock and of books that are banned. And shelf by shelf, a whole libraries will raise. And the shelves in those libraries, what a great world they'll make. I thought I would end by uh, quickly reading the book When We Say Black Lives Matter so you can kind of see some of the artwork choices that I've made to kind of make this book both an anthem for adults and for children. Um, so the choice of colours in this book is kind of chosen from the civil rights movement um, in the 60s and 70s, you know, all of those fabulous kind of um, camel colours with emerald green and things like that that people were wearing at that time. I've also used a kind of stained glass technique on some of the illustrations, which you understand what I mean when I kind of move through it. And that's kind of a nod to black churches and the way that atrocities have happened in black churches, um, including the Birmingham, Alabama church bombings and the um, Emmanuel Espicopel uh, church um, shootings more recently. And also the fact that black churches are places of community and gathering and, and love. Um, so there are various kind of things, nods like that, that I've made to the adult experience. And it's also written in the voice of an adult talking to a child for that reason. When we say black lives matter. Little one. When we say black lives matter, we're saying black people are wonderful strong. That we deserve to be treated with basic respect and that history has done us wrong. Little love, when we call out Black Lives Matter, we're saying walk with us, raise your voice, tenor, baritone, alto, soprano, we'll make a jazz howl of a noise. When we scream out Black Lives Matter and we march against falling night, we're saying enough is enough is enough and we need to put things right. Darling, when we sing that Black Lives Matter and we're dancing through the streets, we're saying fear will not destroy our joy, defiance in our feet. When we whisper Black Lives Matter, we're remembering the past, all the terrible things that were said and done. We're saying they trouble our hearts. When we sob that Black Lives Matter, we're saying trouble still stalks to this day. That we've seen it monster in the shadows and must all help drive it away. My sweet, when we bellow Black Lives Matter, we're saying ain't no freedom till we get ours. And all black folks still suffering will stand with you, we vow. When we smile Black Lives Matter, we're raising our spirits high. We're saying we are here and we are enough. Black, beautiful, brave, my child. When we laugh that Black Lives Matter, that's the ancestors inside a thundering on djembe drums and guiding us steady to rise. When we know that black lives matter, then darling, we know our worth, that we are as precious as every soul whose story has journeyed the earth. We see you, black child magic, your radiant black shine. We hear your black lives matter, and we know we'll be all right. <laughs> Uh, oration. What an amazing address for us this evening, our first Dean's Lecture. Maxine, thank you so much. Uh, I'll introduce myself. I'm Larissa McLean Davies. I'm the Deputy Dean here. And I'm really excited because as an English teacher, I've worked with Maxine's texts. Um, and as an educator, I've worked with many pre-service and in-service teachers around this. Well, um, I just want to thank you wholeheartedly on behalf of the Graduate School of Education for delivering this lecture. We have a protocol in, in literacy education, which is we, we encourage our students to make text-to-text -text connections, text-to-self connections and text-to-world connections. 
and in a, in a climate of understanding that English has been part, it is indeed the colonial project, the work that you are doing uh, and that we are able to do, all of us in literacy, all of us in English and all of us in education really, because it is the stories that we bring into our conversations that really matter. So the text to text, starting with Icarus, working through all of those texts, it's bringing texts into conversation with each other. The text itself, I hope that there's no one here who doesn't feel that their own work and practice is changed, has not been changed by tonight. The way in which you are going to go into your teaching or the way that you're going to go into your research or into your conversations because the text to self is not just for English teachers but it is for all of us and the text to world. Um, it's good to remind ourselves that education, as I said, was part of that colonial project and that we are anti in anti-colonial times working against that and that bringing um, voices of colour, bringing Indigenous writing into the curriculum is precisely the work that we do to change Australian society because it's the books really to shape us. So that text to world is really fundamental to us. So thank you for bringing the conversation here tonight. Thank you for um, coming on International Women's Day, which is not an unproblematic <laughs> day, and we acknowledge that. And, and thank you all of you for coming. It's been great to have the conversation and great to have it here this evening. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you.